All right, so thanks everyone. Seminar. Um, we have a, a rather unusual topic for you today and a rather unusual mode of presentation. Um, so we have a uh, presentation by committee, um, effectively. We have um, a year in review of the CS Area Super Facility Project, um, where everyone who's been involved in the Super Facility Project, all the um, leads of all the different technical work areas, and all the leads for the science engagements are going to come and tell us uh, about what the work they've been doing in the last year. Um, so this is going to be a, a quick fire um, turnaround of speakers. So everyone who's speaking, please come on up um, when it's time for you to present your slide and uh, we'll get through this, I think, seamlessly. So the, uh, let's see. All right, so I want to just start off by introducing this idea. Super facility is a word that has been in circulation at Berkeley Lab for quite a number of years now. This is a concept that Kathy Yellick was a big proponent of. Um, there's, a lot of there's a few different ways in which people use the term super facility. So I want to go through a little bit um, what we mean when we talk about a super facility and um, what, how this is um, fed into the CS area strategic planning around super facility and how that uh, developed into the super facility project itself. Um, and then Corey's going to talk a little bit more about um, what the project um, is doing technically. So um, at its kind of most basic uh, definition, the super facility is a set of connected facilities, a set of connected perhaps DOE user facilities, experimental and observational facilities. So um, this you know, would mean an experimental facility, perhaps connected to ESnet, connected to an HPC facility like NERSC. But the super facility concept is really wider than that. It's not just simply sticking these um, pieces of equipment together. It also encompasses uh, the whole environment of software and tools and functionality that needs to be developed in order to take advantage of these connected facilities. And it also it, it requires a lot of expertise. So expertise on the um, part of the scientists who are using the experimental facilities and the networking expertise and the computing expertise, both in research areas and in uh, facilities integration within uh, the supercomputing centers. So this is really a whole ecosystem um, of connected um, uh, facilities, software and expertise. And the aim, of course, is to uh, enable new modes of discovery um, to couple experimental science with large scale data analysis and simulation. So that's kind of the overall um, vision for what a super facility should look like. Um, and at Berkeley Lab, um, this was encapsulated in the CS Area Strategic Plan, which was developed during uh, 2018, I think published finally in 2019. So one of the initiatives in the strategic plan was the Super Facility Initiative. And there's four different components of that, um, a component of user engagement, uh, components around the data lifecycle, so managing uh, the generation, movement and analysis of data across different facilities. Uh, there's a component of automated uh, resource allocation, so that's um, um, both within the networking and in computing sides. And then there is a component of computing at the edge, so developing the hardware and the capabilities to do appropriate um, computing at the, at the experimental sites itself. So the Super Facility Project was really developed in response to this initiative to try to think about how are we going to implement this vision, how are we actually going to make this work? So the aim of the Super Facility Project is to coordinate the work that's being done within the CS area to uh, answer this vision and to develop these kinds of capabilities. And a key part of this is that we're engaging very closely with seven key science uh, applications um, that are driving our requirements and uh, are helping us to understand what it is they really need from, um, from the Super Facility type functionality um, and that we're working very closely with them to make sure that we're able to develop tools that they can actually use and that they can use easily. So our, our goal, our level one goal, um, is by the end of the project, so we're envisioning this as a three-year project, by the end of 2021, three or more of our seven uh, science engagements will be able to demonstrate automated pipelines that can take data from a remote facility, analyze it at large scale on HPC resources without human inter intervention. And that's a really key point. Um, a lot of these um, experimental facilities can use NERSC at the moment, can use ESnet now, but it takes a lot of people in the loop to, to get things running. And it's not easy, it's not seamless. And so a big part of our aim here is to make this easy and routine, not just for the seven engagements that we're already working with, but for the wider community of um, DOE uh, user facilities. 
So there's capabilities here that are needed, uh, including real-time computing with supports, um, dynamic and high-performance networking, both in the wide area network and the local network, um, data management and movement tools, um, and API-driven automation, and authentication using federated identities. So these are all areas that you're going to hear about uh, later in, in the next hour. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give kind of just a, a brief overview of the technical capabilities that the Super Facility Project aims to build. And, um, but before I do that, I kind of want to relate that to um, what Debbie just talked about and kind of give you an idea of how we've structured and organized the, the project. So, you know, we've all worked with technology for, for a long time, some of us. And so, you know, there's sort of this classic problem when you're trying to do any sort of innovation. If you're interacting with a user or someone who needs something, and you're trying to find out what they need, but they're also trying to find out what the possibilities even are. And sometimes there's this exchange and a gap that you can't, you can't get past. Well, what do you need? Why can't you tell me what you need? Well, I, because I don't even know what the range of possibilities are. And so we designed this process uh, very deliberately to try to engage with the projects across a, a, a breadth of different science that we thought would represent really interesting challenges and a diverse set of challenges for us to meet. And at the same time, we assembled uh, technical project leads in the areas where we felt innovations would be useful. And, um, and so the, the science engagements here uh, on, the, on the right, we're gonna talk about them a little bit more and the kind of science that they do. Um, <clears throat> but why, what I wanted to talk about first was the areas of technical work that, that we actually arrived at through our initial engagements with them, our initial conversations with them to say like, where are you heading? What are the kinds of work you do? Uh, where are some of the challenges? So that we could distill that into a set of new capabilities that we could build as generalized sort of building blocks, new capabilities for the center that all of these projects could take advantage of. And these are the areas of, uh, of uh, technical work and new capabilities. There's, they're sort of grouped into, into by similar themes there. But the, the first here is the idea of being able to schedule real-time computing far in the future, not a job submission, but far, far in the future when you know that a beam time is scheduled or the, uh, the run of a detector is scheduled. So that that is something that we can accommodate on a big compute system. The, the second line here, software defined networks, sense project, our relation to that, and uh, more forward looking self managed systems are all about um, the automated management of the system itself and, um, and automation for some of the resources that are needed. Uh, the third one, which is probably near and dear to some of the people here is just, is to, um, we hear this theme over and over from all the science projects that if it were only easier to move data around uh, within the center and in and out of the center, and if it were only easier to visualize what my data usage is and be able to get a handle on how to manage that, um, and if I had better tools for uh, producing data in the first place, then a lot of the most tedious work would be simplified. That's the third category. Um, the fourth is uh, <coughs> SPIN is a, a new service that's uh, operated in, in my group that's uh, containers as a service platform. And this is meant to respond to a need to, um, to science projects that need something beyond just traditional HPC, a persistent service like a database or a workflow engine or, uh, or a, um, a service that works in, in partnership with a uh, real-time detector, something like that. All kinds of these network services have been running for a long time under people's desks and in closets and on login nodes until someone comes along and finds them and shuts them down. And so SPIN was about building a service that uses containers to build a secure and scalable platform for those services to exist in. <clears throat> and last but not least, um, API and federated identity. So we want, really want to make automation kind of built in from the ground up in these initiatives. And so that's why, um, that's why this is described as 
everything you see here, automate it all. So if you can imagine uh, interacting anything you do with NERSC, doing that via API, that's sort of the long-term vision. And while we're at it, um, blending in use of uh, modern authentication techniques for, um, for uh, leveraging federated authentication to log in with your home institution and use that identity with, uh, with NERSC. So this is the broad set of capabilities and we're gonna do lightning talks that go into each, each uh, one of these, but you can see the relationship that we built between the, of the requirements gathering we did initially <clears throat> and translated those into this initial set of techn technical capabilities. If we deliver, we feel like can lift all these projects up. It's an ongoing process though. So as we deliver um, and build new functionality or even come up with our plans for how to do it, we've tried to have conversations back to the science projects and say, this is sort of what we're planning. Will this work for you? Are you planning to use what we're planning to deliver? And if the answer is yes, then we know we're on the right track. But if the answer is no, then we know we have to come back and think of new ideas or adjust what our plans are. <clears throat> so it's this process, like I said, at the beginning of trying to find that intersection point between unmet needs and things that could exist if we put effort toward them to, to produce this demonstrated outcome. So, um, so here's we, where we go into the lightning talk section. And let's see, who is first up? It's gonna be, you talk about streaming, uh, it's gonna be streaming people in here. <laughs> All right, so I'm uh, standing in for Roland Thomas, um, who's uh, not here today. So one of the things that um, we want to emphasize in this, this work, it, we, the computing element is important here. And so uh, part of the um, work that we're tracking within um, the Student Facility Project is work that's being done within the NESAP program. So NESAP, for anyone in the room who's not familiar with it, is the nurse program um, for, um, I actually don't remember what the acronym is right now, but it's application readiness um, for, um, for some particular teams that we're working mm -hmm. with. And we have several teams um, that are part of the super facility project that are part of the NESAP program, both the NESAP for data program and also the NESAP for simulations program. So um, what it's part of the, a big part of the work that we've done this year um, in the NESAP program has been recruitment. So we've recruited um, both staff and postdocs to work on super facility related uh, projects um, with three uh, people who are specifically hired to work on uh, super facility related um, projects as part of NESAP and as part of the ECP NESAP branch, um, which we're uh, very excited about. Um, and one of the big um, milestones for NESAP for this year has been the benchmarking all the applications on Edison. That's part of the Nurse 9 project requirements, um, and it's also um, uh, an important base level of seeing how the applications perform on the Edison hardware and then working on um, developing the capabilities to run on Perlmutter when that arrives. Um, there's also been significant participation in the NESAP hackathons by super facility uh, science engagement teams. Um, so for example, um, the Tomo Pai team from ALS um, was participated and was able to get a 30x speed up uh, on their GPU uh, reconstruction, which is a fantastic result. And we've also had um, XFL participation, DESI and LZ um, participation in hackathons, both last year and also in uh, planning to come to upcoming hackathons. So this is kind of the element of the super facility project that's really helping getting the code ready to run on Perlmutter, because that's a big focus for us for the future. All right, so the next slide is Jupiter. Uh, Shreyas, I think you're going to take this one. Yeah, so um, part of the, the making the site super facility idea useful is providing people with easy interfaces to be able to access their data, to be able to run their analyses and do it in a you know visual way from wherever they're sitting. Um, and in talking to a bunch of users, I think we found out that Jupyter actually fits a lot of these requirements. And so we're engaging with a couple of projects to drive some of these requirements to figure out what, how is it that we can make Jupyter and notebook environments useful for these kinds of distributed super facility projects. Um, so the first um, group that we engaged with were the folks from NSEM. And 
they already had some notebooks that they were running kind of on a single node basis to look at their data. Um, and, but, but they really would like to, or wanted to be able to do this um, on a much larger data set running at NERSC. Um, and, and so we worked with them to be able to connect Jupyter with um, a Dask backend um, so that they could actually parallelize their image analysis which um, ended up giving them a huge boost. And I think that 20x number is actually more. It's, it's, it's closer to 80 times there. Um, I, yeah, it, it's, we, we give, we, it was a significant speed up, um, but it also had the, the effect of being able to capture a pattern that we can start to use over and over again with other projects, which is here's a notebook-based workflow. How do I take certain steps in the notebook and then push them out to um, a bunch of HPC nodes on the back end to be able to get scalable workflows. Um, one of the other, some of the other tools that were useful, I think that came up were this idea of having parameterized notebooks where you can run a notebook and essentially do a parameter sweep that would generate notebooks across a bunch of different examples. Um, and then the idea of a curated notebook environment. So if you think of a project as taking data at the source, they want to be able to take a canned analysis and be able to spin that up at NERSC um, and run that and a notebook serves as a good way of doing that, but then they can also tweak that and customize it as they see fit. So it's this nice bridge between a curated notebook for a project that can go alongside some data and can go alongside an experiment. Um, but then you just, we have tools that let you take these repos that are sitting in GitHub and to automatically copy and launch them over to NERSC um, and run your analysis through those. Um, and then finally, I also wanted to mention that we held a Jupyter community workshop um, in conjunction with the folks at BIDS. And the idea was to bring together people from HPC and experimental facilities together. And the, we actually had a really nice turnout there. So seven DOE labs, lots of different facilities, all of the major kind of parties that we're talking to and, and various others. Um, in terms of how they're using notebooks to facilitate these kinds of workflows. Um, lots of good discussion that came out of it, lots of sort of potential future collaboration. So um, overall, we've had, you know, we've had a lot of nice little stories and successes and we're continuing to sort of build out the suite of tools and, and capabilities that, that Jupyter is doing. And also besides all this stuff, we've also been, you know, pushing for various modes of deployment of Jupyter at NERSC itself. So that includes things like access to different classes of nodes, um, you know, being able to run notebooks on your GPUs or on your backend nodes or on a query login node or in spin. Um, so that work's also been going on. All right, I think that's mostly that covers Jupyter, at least the highlights. There's lots of little details which we can talk about later if you have questions. Hey, thanks, Shreyas. All right, so next, um, Aditi is going to talk us through the slum simulator. So um, the purpose of the slum simulator was to study the basic operational bottleneck of supporting real-time workloads. So if we allocate a portion of Cori to support real-time needs, then it affects the scheduling for all the other jobs who do not have real-time needs. And as it is, people wait for weeks to get their job to run on Cori. So the purpose of Slurm Simulator was to see if we could somehow simulate Cori and see how the waiting times would be impacted if we were to allocate a portion of the machine to real-time workloads. And we did analyze, so last, last year in the summer, I spent some time studying Slurm Simulators and we analyzed two of them. And Slurm is a really monolithic piece of code and you have to run the Slurm controller, simulate various state of jobs and provide a dummy configuration file. And then it sort of cycles through those jobs and tells you how and when it's gonna schedule them. And it takes a bit of time. So just to simulate, let's say a hundred cores, it took roughly about six hours to simulate, let's say a month of Cori. So then we found out that if we have to uh, simulate the entire scale of Cori, it would roughly take running Slurm Simulator on Cori <laughs> to be able to <laughs> simulate that. So we also tried uh, having a talk with SCADMD to uh, 
support to sort of get them to agree to an NRE in supporting Slum Simulator. And they had the exact same idea that Slum Simulator is not a viable approach for performing the kind of analysis that we are looking for. So then what we, and Chris is gonna talk about that next, we took more analytical approaches and we took other more technical approaches in dealing with the operational bottlenecks that I just described. And at this moment, we are not pursuing this particular approach, but there are other analytical efforts that are in progress to fix these operational problems. Cool. This is one remark that when I was in SC last year, I was casually joking to people about Slurm Simulator, that how hard it is to simulate Slurm. And they told me that once we have quantum computers, it would become really simple. So <laughs> we have some hope. <laughs> So that'll be great. What could go wrong? Um, so advanced scheduling. So this is referring to what Aditi was talking about there, where one of the issues with having real-time workloads is you need to reserve resources in some way or kick people off. And so if you're reserving, then you cause a time where there may be no usage at all, and you could productively use that time. So what we looked at is a number of options for how we could get the best performance out of Cori without impacting traditional workloads whilst not delaying um, real time and experimental stuff. So we looked through a series of things and basically came to the idea that the best way to do this was to have some form of a reservation where a experimental job can request that, but you allow other workload into it in the interim um, and then evict it when the real workload comes along. So we talked to SCADMD about that, and Aditi did a lot of that negotiation and contract stuff. Um, and we basically asked them for this, this functionality, and that was delivered in Slurm 2020. So I've done testing already with um, the master branch about a month and a half ago, um, just to validate that what they were merging would work. And it does. I mean, it was, it was some fairly basic testing because it was running on Gertie, and not in a standard install, um, but it was it was great. I could create a reservation as um, myself and submit some jobs as Doug, and they were running that reservation until I came along around something, and then it would kill his stuff and my stuff would run. And the idea is that the group who needs a reservation for the experimental workload says, I can tolerate a latency for my job start at a certain amount of time. The users who submit jobs willing to be preempted say I want to run for up to another amount of time and as long as the length of time of the job was, is less than the latency that the experimentalist can tolerate it will run in there um, and will run until the real workload comes along and gets preempted so that's it so the other thing I'm going to mention is also in 2002 it's not something we funded um, that SCADMD have been working on this is there's a REST API coming there which is great has one drawback, which is that in the current implementation, we can't use it for job submission. Um, but one of my thoughts is for NRE for 2011 is um, to try and get them to fix that. So that's it. All right, next up, uh, uh, it's me again. <laughs> Uh, so one of the um, key areas in supervisibility projects is workflow resilience and this has a number of different components and um, what we've been focusing on this year is um, helping our experimental uh, engagements to um, develop um, the appropriate level of resiliency in their workflows. So nurse is going to be unavailable sometimes we're working really hard internally to minimize the impact of um, downtimes of um, of uh, software updates of power outages um, on our users and there's a lot of work that's going on especially this year focus working facilities um, around that um, but one of the things we need to be able to do is help um, the experimental teams we work with to understand what um, what could what would, will be um, up and down at NERSC and what they should do in order to um, to mitigate the downtimes how they can have best practices in, in workflow resiliency so we developed a set of advice for this, published a web page around it. 
And there's a number of uh, tools, for example, Kelly Rowland developed a tool to containerize a conda environment to allow it to be transferred elsewhere, which is a neat little tool. It's called C2D. It's on our nurse GitHub if anyone's interested in that. Um, we've also uh, submitted an ALCC request um, for time across the, uh, the OSCAR computing facilities to trial cross OSCAR facility workflows. This is something that um, Katie Antipas was leading. So we'd like to be able to demonstrate workflows running on multiple sites um, this year. That's one of the things that we're, we're working towards um, for this year. And, and in trying this out, we want to really understand what the pain points are, what's difficult about this, what's going to make this challenging in the future if this is a, a longer term direction for us. Um, another sort of key engagement um, with workflow resiliency is, is what we work very closely with the LZ experiments um, to uh, incorporate resiliency into their workflow design, into their computing design. That's work that Lisa Gerhardt's been, been leading. Um, and this is a key parameter now of the upcoming computing readiness review. So this is an area where we're able to really work closely um, with a science team to, to um, help them uh, design resiliency into their, into their computing model. Right, uh, next we're all talking about the API. Yeah, so uh, the API design uh, aims to uh, have the uh, scientific facilities be able to submit workflows and jobs and in general interact with NERSC as if they had you know, done in the past via SSH. And so the API design, part of it came from talking with the experimental groups and part of it came from uh, looking at what else is out there. So there are other projects similar to super facility that already have an API. And so we looked at those also. Uh, so what we have today is we have a demo site. That's the URL. Uh, you can go there and browse the documentation and try some of the functionality. It's Swagger based. So if you're familiar with that, it's, it's a, a way to describe an API and sort of self document the code. Uh, it runs on spin and uh, we have, our hope is that the next version of Slurm, as Chris mentioned, has a REST API so that currently we submit jobs and talk to NERSC via SSH, but we're hoping that in the next version we'll be able to do it through the REST API. So in that case, we would provide the authentication, authorization, and then Slurm will do the, the REST. And then these are the uh, current API endpoints. Uh, authentication will give you a, currently it takes a username and password, but Mark will talk about how that will evolve in the future. It will give you back a jot, which is an encrypted uh, piece of text. Uh, accounting uh, uh, interfaces with Iris, so you can get your allocation data, et cetera. Health uh, will show you the uh, kind of a, a breakdown of <coughs> system components at NERSC at, and what their current status is. Uh, and then jobs lets you submit jobs, transfer data, and reservations is more for an experimental facility uh, creating a future reservation and allocating time and resources at NERSC. That's it. So the work that's gone on in the area of federated ID um, can kind of be broken down into these three main areas. The first part really was design. Um, federated identity and federated authentication is a very, fairly ambiguous term. And so defining exactly what it meant and what was important to the scientific projects and the technologies that we would use at, at NERSC was really the first part of this. And so we decided on an architecture that uses SAML, which is kind of the, the uh, federated uh, um, protocol that's been in use in academia and research and education for decades now. Mm -hmm. And we're all fairly familiar with it's what we use when we log into um, identity.lbl.gov it's the nurse um, identity provider and it's been around a long time but more recently open id connect and oauth 2 have become more important protocols and these are the tokens that the board just um, talked about and they're important um, in this application because they're much more portable and so you can get a token and you can pass it around to downstream applications much more easily than you can a saml assertion so then we've started in on the implementation. And the first step really is to have federation aware identity and access management components. And this was part of the, the NIM replacement project. And so the, the actual banking aspect of this is further ahead than the identity and access management components. We had some um, NRE uh, 
for an open source project in order to make it more appropriate for NERSC. And so that's still in progress. And so we're phasing in these kind of core IAM components over time and integrating those with IRIS. Um, the OpenID Connect Identity Provider is a brand new technology for us. We've, as I mentioned, only been SAML in the past. And so we now have what I'd term a pilot quality OpenID Connect Identity Provider alongside our SAML Identity Provider. And then we're also working on an identity provider proxy. And this basically uh, is kind of an intermediate point. I'll show a diagram of it in just a second, but it allows the applications to connect to this proxy. The proxy will then direct users and allow them to select their home identity and then they'll authenticate. But when it comes back, it combines the, it aggregates attributes that are um, obtained from the home identity, but also puts in NERSC specific attributes that are um, necessary for these workflows. And that'll include things like your NERSC, ident your NERSC user ID, uh, what projects you're part of, and other authenticate or authorization decisions. And then a big part of this is really just policy. So there, the technology is one thing, but this is kind of a new area for NERSC to trust external identity providers. And so there's a lot of policy wrapped up in this. And one of those is just how to handle multi-factor when someone's authenticating somewhere else. And we've made a proposal on how we would handle that without diminishing our current security stance in the area of MFA. There's also which authentication sources uh, we're willing to accept. And so that's kind of an ongoing discussion right now. And I think we're getting closer and closer to having a proposal. And then there's also uh, kind of, I don't know if it's the holy grail, but it's, it's something we're looking forward to how would we streamline account provisioning for people that are users of experimental and observational facilities? And that's, well, we're just starting those discussions here. They're also a topic of discussion with Rich Carlson's DCDE uh, working group. So this is more or less how it works um, for a federated login for SAML or to get a, a OpenID Connect OAuth2 token. So the user basically interacts with a tool like Iris and is redirected to the proxy. And then the proxy allows a user to go out and select any home identity. In this case, um, this is the InCommon Federation, which is the US Research and Education Federation. And that, we believe, just from a quick survey of our users, that covers about 75% of our users between the InCommon Federation and DOE um, One ID. So, if we broaden the definition even more broadly, we get up to like 90% of our users look like they have uh, external IDP that um, could serve for, for the authentication. Then when the authentication comes back to the proxy, the co-managing grouper components or the internal components that provide these nurse specific authorization account info and returns that to the, to the actual application. And it's an opportunity also to request a multi-factor step if the home identity provider didn't include that. Okay, so Spin, like I mentioned earlier in the overview is a platform where users can come and run services that they design that are built on um, Docker containers. And uh, so we actually launched the pilot of SPIN in um, mid-2018. And so over 2019, our, our real activity was uh, just ramping up the service. So we conducted a lot of workshops through the year, um, built the user base up to about 135 users. And, um, and as of uh, the end of the year, there's probably over 100 different services running. Uh, in spin in a variety of stages from you know prototyping to to production services um, so within the super facility project uh, specifically um, we've <clears throat> had uh, well we've we've shown some interest here and engaged with some of the some of those projects to help them get their services running in spin and I've just kind of highlighted hear which of the projects that we that we're partnering with in the super facility project and sort of what they're doing in spin so we're happy to see that that uptake um, the other thing that we've started to do toward the end of 2019 and coming into 2020 is an upgrade of the infrastructure that sits 
sits beneath uh, SPIN to um, incorporate the Kubernetes technology, which has um, be become much more popular since our launch of the service in 2018. So, um, so we're, we're really happy that the, the projects are finding use for this kind of uh, infrastructure as part of their project and helps to kind of validate what the vision was. There you are, sorry. I thought you were remote for some reason. So I want to talk about self-managed systems. Um, and really this is figuring out which knobs are on the system that impact our application's performance and figuring out how to tune those automatically. Um, and so for discovering what the knobs are in the systems, we rely on domain experts. So these are people who understand the networks or power or file system or scheduling. Um, and then there's that second component of understanding how it impacts performance. So part of this group has really been bringing together um, those domain experts with people who are doing data collection on our systems, things like LDMS or the ops groups, to really pull that data out, see how uh, tuning the system impacts the performance, and then we're trying to figure out how we can improve it for the super facility use cases. So one of the um, examples there is, is from some work we did where a common complaint is that the network may have jitter or um, perform uh, poorly at times and super facility workflows may want to have some sort of real time feedback looking at images where you, know, you have a human in the loop and you don't really want to have that jitter. Um, so the question we asked is, can we predict, given the counters on the network uh, in the current network state, what the impact is on application performance? Um, and so we went through um, a prototype of that in an IPDPS paper, but there's many other uh, ongoing works. There's people looking at power and other things. Um, so really, this is my uh, chance to advertise the working group. Um, if you're interested in this sort of discussion we meet monthly and there's a link at the bottom there in Google groups so yeah thanks uh, so big focus of the SDN technology area is to make network as a schedulable resource so one of the projects we've been helping with is LCLS. We work with ESNet to help LCLS to establish dynamic network paths to NASC. So LCLS, when they want to start running an experiment, they can establish a path onto our backup link to ESNet and they can tear it down. This is all transparent to us and doesn't involve manual intervention. Another project we onboarded is NSIM. We actually rolled out our data center to the molecular foundry and uh, we connected them at 400 gig. The specifics of the project I'm going to talk about in a, a future slide. And another thing which we work with CSG, especially other the Doug and James, um, was to uh, create a plugin in Slurm for bandwidth intensive uh, compute experiments so that they can schedule compute nodes, reserve compute nodes in a bandwidth balanced manner. Basically what the plugin does is it looks at all the bridge nodes, the health of the bridge nodes and maps compute in an optimal bandwidth optimal manner across the bridge nodes. So this would help with real time computing experiments which need some bandwidth balanced operation. So these are a few of the areas which STN is looking at. And if there is a need for something internal in terms of a special tunnel path or something like that in, internal to our network, please let us know and we can work on it. Thank you. All right, so next up um, is Sense. Um, so Alex and Shin couldn't be with us today, but they sent me some notes uh, to uh, read out uh, so I can explain a little bit about what the Sense project has been doing. So Sense stands for Software Defined Networking for End-to-End -end Network Science at the Exascale. 
So they've been working very closely with LCLS, um, uh, what, as, as Ashwin was mentioning just earlier. They want to build an intent-driven multi-domain orchestration framework to allow distributed science workflows to provision and manage the full end-to-end -end network services. So um, that includes um, on-site and um, site-edge uh, data caching. So um, a lot of the work this year was around um, working with LCLS to demonstrate these capabilities for an XFL um, ECP workflow. Um, and they also had a demonstration at SC19, um, which uh, used um, a dynamic, I'm reading this because uh, this is not my area of expertise, dynamic attachments of end-site resources to layer three virtual private network connections advertised by ESnet. So this is basically this bottom uh, diagram here describes this. It's a very complex set of uh, sites um, and connections um, from a lot of different places. And this is all uh, managed by Sense Components. The Sense Components was driving the, the connections there. So plans um, in 2020 um, involve um, working closely with the nurse group, um, the SDN group, in the, the last so-called last mile problem. So making sure that everything connects up all the way from the edge of nurse all the way into the compute node so that the path from the DTN into a compute node um, is as performance and perhaps as controllable as the path from the experiments to NERSC. Um, this is uh, one of the things that they're looking at. Another thing that actually has a nice cross um, uh, pollination with other work that's going on in the super facility project is they're also looking into federated ID. So uh, integrating prototype elements of federated ID within Sense to allow this kind of capability um, for, for authentication in the network as well as in the computing. Okay, so next, our data movement. Hi, so uh, like Debbie and Corey mentioned before, the main thrust of this is to take some of the burden of managing data across the various layers of the file system at NERSC um, from these super facility projects and also make it easier to transfer data in and out of the center and to share data. Um, and so in 2019, um, we did a lot of work. The Globus Sharing Endpoint was deployed um, and the ALS team used this for a particular four day run where they were sharing seven terabytes of data um, and they sort of automatically set up sharing endpoints to share with users from UCLA and, and Boulder um, using this framework that Bjorn Enders and his student created. Um, and this is done with the ALS scientists with minimal people in the loop. They just use the interface to create this and they were able to share this data out. Um, in addition to this sort of this example, um, about 275 terabytes of data have been shared via the global sharing endpoints in 2019. So this is a pretty active endpoint. Um, and it's really useful for allowing collaborations to share with a select set of users. Uh, we've also deployed uh, command line data transfer tools that use Globus on the back end. Um, and so these allow for large scale data transfers um, to be integrated more easily with workflow tools. So if you have a bunch of data you need to move into or out of the center or between the layers of the file system um, and you wanna do it programmatically, you can invoke this command line tool instead of going to the Globus UI and dragging and dropping. Um, and these are going to be the building blocks for the interface into the super facility API to, to do data transfer. We're also working with Chris and Aditi in CSG to try and get this integrated into batch system data movement um, so that you can move your data up from community to scratch and have it be ready. Um, and one of the nice things about this is since we made this here, um, it actually handles HPSS access correctly, um, which has always been a problem with Globus. Uh, but it does it, it, it does it correctly. So um, and we're also working with members of the storage group. I see Greg here um, to deploy the prototype GPFS HPSS integration. Um, and what this does is it, for the user teams, it presents a file system, a very file system like interface for HPSS. Um, you put the files on GPFS, they're automatically moved into HPSS um, in a way that is sensible for tape storage. Um, and so we're looking at this as one of the ways to take a lot of the heavy lifting of putting a copy of your data into the archive um, and doing it properly. Instead, you can just put it on the SCII file system and it would automatically move into HPSS and you can retrieve it with a couple of set of specific commands uh, fairly easily. Uh, we have this data dashboard, which is uh, something that we put up together for NERSC users as something completely outside of the super facility project initially, because it was just something people wanted to be able to do 
it gives people the ability to kind of manage their data use, using a, a graphical web-based interface, which is uh, a, little, a little more simple to use um, than, than some of the other tools we may have, uh, and especially more performant compared to like going in and waiting for LS to return on something that's a huge directory. Um, so uh, part of solving the, that problem to get this working as a web-based tool meant that we had something that could be useful for the super facility as well. Uh, and so we've been working on uh, what you see on the left-hand side is an example of our PI interface. So this is a way that PIs will be able to go in and browse through the files that they have in a specific directory, um, like at a project directory level. And then they can you know, drill down through there, move up and down, select things, uh, perform operations on the things they selected. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, simple interface at this point, and we're, we're hoping to soon be expanding that into things more related to actual moving of the data, um, leveraging the stuff you saw on the previous slide. Um, and this, the example on the right is just another piece of the data dashboard that will also probably find its way into the super facility API or uh, uh, interface. Um, and this is a way for anyone, not necessarily just a PI, to go in and be able to see what files you have and visualize them. And you see the structure that the, 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 the directory structure has. And then um, there's like a place where you can kind of hover over an individual directory and you see a list of the files within there and you can see some of the basic metadata about it. So we're hoping to expand that more as we get more of the back end to kick up with, with what we've got so far. So I think uh, Quincy is next. Yep. Hi, y'all. Um, oops, can someone advance the slide? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, HDF5 is a popular IO middleware package that many applications, um, both at NERSC and broadly within the DOE and internationally, uh, of course, use. And as part of the super facility focused efforts, we're trying to do two different sides of the equation here, of the same coin almost. Uh, we're developing a, a virtual object layer connector for HDF5 that will open up um, XTC2 files to be read within and analyzed within the HDF5 ecosystem. So all the HDF5 tools that use HDF5 API routines will be able to um, sequence through and analyze um, all the XTC2 data out there once this is completed. We're in the final stages of wrapping up this all connector. It's completely transparent to them. They will just set an environment variable and the dynamic library that um, is uh, implements the, the vault connector will get invoked and they'll be able to access the XTC2 file. So they'll open up broadly into the HDF5 ecosystem. And on the flip side, um, we're trying to bring data from Slack directly into Cori at this point, but in the future, Perlmutter and other systems. Um, in a, you know, this is the core of the super facility effort, right? How can we stream our data from a remote sense, you know, um, experimental site into a supercomputer? And so as part of HDF5, we've implemented another um, connector-like plugin that, again, transparently to the application, will just take HDF5 um, files that are being written locally at Slack and stream them over the network and write them also um, at NERSC. So this is a mirror um, VFD that's connected up to a splitter VFD for HDF5's technologies. In the future, we're gonna work on more um, expansions to HDF5 that help with variable length data in the streamed environment and um, other logical spin-offs of these things. Okay. All right, anything else, Quincy? I don't want to oh, no. trust you. Okay, okay. thanks. All right, and I think uh, Lavanya's on uh, line and can speak to the work that her group's been doing around <laughs> workflow analysis. Sure, um, thanks Debbie. So Debbie asked me to add a couple of slides on some of the work uh, we've been doing in collaboration with NERSC. Um, and I just uh, have two slides on this. I'm gonna be really quick because I do realize there's more slides and less time at this point. Um, so we've been working with uh, LCLS workflows, um, trying to analyze what they have um, running on NERSC, but also trying to get some of their workflows up and running. 
Uh, the focus in this particular project is looking at sort of data patterns and policies. So we're using Darshan to analyze the IO patterns and identify uh, the different patterns of, of computational and storage uh, use and trying to understand what these workflows would need on nurse systems going forward. Uh, we've been also looking at the batch job uh, log queues, uh, queue information um, to analyze sort of what their workflows are. I presented this in the December meeting because the methodology was de developed in the context of the CRD nurse project. Um, can uh, someone advance the slide for me, which is the next slide? All right, so here we, what we're doing in the, with this is really using um, Darshan logs uh, where available, which is only a small percentage, uh, to reconstruct workflows so we can actually start viewing uh, the world more as workflows rather than jobs, uh, which will allow us to do some optimizations when it comes to IO, network, things like that. Um, and so we've been doing some analysis there. Uh, we've also started thinking about implicit workflows where we look at the job logs with time windows and sort of say, hey, what did a user run in a certain period of time and how did their workflows perform? Um, in that. So I presented most of these um, at the December meeting. We have some more analysis since then, uh, but this allows us to look at these logs, understand sort of failure patterns, understand uh, how jo jobs might be clubbed together um, in ways that we cannot uh, anticipate if we in terms for optimization and things like that. So I'm happy to talk more with anyone who's interested um, in knowing more details about this. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're, um, we've managed to get through all of our technical um, work highlights. I wanted to give an opportunity, and um, we also have some uh, science highlights, which are kind of summarizing how the technical work has been uh, incorporated into the, uh, some of the science teams we're working with and how they're actually using some of these tools. Um, but before we do that, given the time, uh, I wanted to see what questions people have. Are there any questions right now for the, um, for the technical work leads? Or comments? Debbie? I, I hear someone online, I think. It's, it's Craig Tull. Hi, Craig. I can barely hear you. Oh, well, I, I had to uh, unplug my good speaker, so uh, I'll have to just speak. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hey, listen, one thing I did not see in any of the presentations was a, a sort of a timeline deliverables commitments to uh, um, the ability to actually use these and uh, um, tools and technologies and anything more than a kind of a demo or, or sort of test uh, um, uh, capability. And I just wanted to remind you that SPOT is hoping that uh, um, this uh, effort sort of uh, results in something that can actually uh, um, take over some of the work that we've been doing for the ALS and for the last seven years we've been running 24 seven and uh, we're still running and you know we're up at uh, 3.7 petabytes of data and you know 7 million jobs on the uh, nurse run and managed and uh, I'm wondering when this level of the scale of uh, um, actual day-to-day -day super facility workload could actually be offloaded to some of these tools in a way that doesn't require you know sort of infinite manpower so do you can you speak a little bit to the timeline for uh, um deliverables and uh, um a sort of an integrated system that uh, we can look towards yeah that's a great point um so the timeline the timeline of the project is, uh, it was always designed to be a three-year project. So by the end of the three years, so by um, uh, 20, so two years from now, we intend to have everything, uh, all the capabilities that we've de been developing well out of demo mode and into production. But a lot of those capabilities are going to be in production well before that. So um, we uh, have, um, we're, we're a real project. We have milestones, we have timelines, we have Gantt charts. So we have... Um, a time frame for which various different tools are going to be um, ready and production ready. A lot of the capabilities that we're thinking of, that we've been talking about now, we're hoping to have in production in the next six months. Um, so I don't have the, the exact dates for every tool that we're talking about to hand, but if that's something you're interested in, then I can share the uh, timelines that we have at the moment. 
um, for the sort of the next the, what, what we expect to have um, up and running in the next year or so. I would That's, be interested. Great. And can you say um, what you still expect, like the application teams to do for the new digital infrastructure and nurse will provide? I feel like there's a, maybe a big thing. Yeah, so the, the question, the uh, point from Katie was explaining what we expect the application teams to do compared to what we expect, uh, what, what NERSC is going to provide. So NERSC is providing the capabilities, the tools, the infrastructure, the, um, uh, the NERSC-centric um, uh, tools. So a good example of that is, is the data movement tools. So developing tools to automate data movement between the NERSC file systems, but how uh, an application or a, a science team can use that tool is that's up, up to them. So we're supporting the NERSC side capabilities and the ESNet side capabilities um, of, of what, these, what these tools are gonna provide. And then we want to make sure that we're working with the science teams um, so that they understand what these tools do and can give us feedback on, on where they might want to see uh, features. Thank you, I, I'm a little bit nervous that uh, um... I mean, we've already transferred uh, 450,000 files from ALS to NERSC guide. Would we have to rewrite our entire system just based on different tools? Is that, I, I worry about that. Right, we, we're, we're, we're aiming to develop tools that are gonna be sustainable. These aren't sort of one-off demonstrations that we won't be um, maintaining, that we won't be uh, uh, continuing on. So. Yeah, it, it, the choice is always, of course, up to the science team as whether they, the tools meet the needs that they have, but we're aiming for this to be sustainable uh, tools that NERSC is going to be supporting. Thanks. All right, well, we've uh, managed to leave absolutely no time at all for the science highlights. So what I will say is um, that uh, we have uh, our first annual meeting, and so, in a sense, you can think of all the work that you've heard about today as kind of being a trailer for our first uh, annual meeting day. This is going to be on March 31st. Um, we're hosting the first Super Facility Project annual meeting, and there will be um, uh, talks from a whole range of people from our science partners. Um, we have a panel discussion of facility directors, um, so talking about the, the importance of HPC and networking and experimental science. And we'll have a lot of demos and interactive sessions. So if there's particular tools that you've heard about today that you're interested in seeing how this worked. You can come along and, and, and play around with what that looks like and have demonstrations from the nurse staff. And also this is, um, will be containing perspectives from outside of DOE. So we have people coming from outside of the DOE complex to talk a little bit about how they see the connection between HPC and experimental science. So um, everyone is welcome. The website, um, which is a little perhaps hard for you to pass here, but the website um, is, is up um, and uh, registration is open. So please, uh, everyone, come along if you're interested. All right. Thanks to all our speakers for doing such a fantastic job. Uh, thanks.